Great. Well, I think I'm going to get moving. Um, I hope everyone's having a lovely afternoon. Um, very excited to have Claire Kovacs and Meredith Lynn. Uh, Claire is the curator at the Binghamton University Art Museum, had just come from Augustana. Uh, and Meredith is the assistant curator at Florida State University. We're very excited to have them talking about curatorial work as academic labor. It's been an intense topic and something that our museum committee at CAA has been talking about quite a bit. Um, and we're also going to have two students from NYU, our former and current uh, ramp assistants, Olivia Knaus. Uh, Olivia, if you could just wave and say hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> and Laura Busby. Hello, hi. Hi. And I am actually going to hand things over to Laura, who's done a lot of work on this. And uh, we're just going to have a small discussion. And as you can see, we also have a presentation coming up. So Claire and Meredith are going to sort of explain uh, this as they did at AMG recently. So then we can, and you can add questions. Um, if you look to the side, on the bottom left, there's a little bubble with writing in it. If you click on that, you can type in questions if you like. Um, you can also turn your video and sound on and wave a little bit if you'd like to ask it on video. Uh, but feel free to ask questions whenever you like. So Laura, I'm going to hand it over to you now. Thank you, Callie. Hi, Claire. Hi, Meredith. I can't see you, but I know you're out there somewhere. <laughs> we yep. look forward to your presentation, and thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate it, and hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, we'll get started. The first question is, can you tell us a bit about each of your academic museums? Meredith, do you want to start that? Sure. Um, and if you, I don't know if you can see, my cat has decided to make an appearance on this <laughs> webinar as well. Um, <laughs> easier to just let him participate, so uh, I will. Uh, so I am the assistant curator and director of galleries at Florida State University um, at our Museum of Fine Arts here. Uh, the Museum of Fine Arts at FSU is a student-focused institution located on our Tallahassee campus, right in the middle of campus, actually. Um, FSU is a really large public university. We serve about 43,000 students, and um, we have a permanent collection of about 7,000 objects, primarily modern and contemporary American. Um, and we do about 15 to 20 exhibitions every year. All right. So I'm Claire Kovacs. I am the new curator at the Binghamton University Art Museum. And as mentioned, I just started here just about six seven weeks ago, uh, coming from Augustana College out in Illinois. So Binghamton, the Binghamton University Art Museum is on the Binghamton University campus, which is part of the SUNY system. We have two main galleries and four smaller galleries. The four smaller galleries change out twice a year, and those are all student curated exhibitions. And then our main galleries change out three times a year. We have a collection of about 4,500 objects, and we serve the students, faculty, staff, and community of the greater Binghamton area. So that's sort of where I'm at. This is a new position um, working with the, the director of the art museum, taking on more of the, the curatorial work and doing a little bit more in direct engagement with students across our campus. So, yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you. How did you two connect? Claire, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, so Meredith and I went to the University of Iowa, but not at the same time. We were a little bit like ships in the night. I was um, getting my PhD in art history and Meredith got her MFA in painting. Um, and so we never actually met at the University of Iowa, but I believe it was at CCAC, the Southeastern College Arts Conference a couple of years ago, where we finally got to meet each other face to face. I had heard about Meredith and the work that she was doing earlier than that. And there was a small group of us that started talking about our shared issues and what are our what are our common struggles um, in these positions as as curators in an academic museum environment or academic gallery environment. And so we started talking and coming out of those conversations came this work that we're working on today. Is that fair? Anything I should have added, Meredith? No, I think that's great. Well, that's fantastic. That's very serendipitous that you two. Yes. 
Uh, my next questions will probably lead us into your presentation. Um, can you tell us about what inspired you to pursue the curatorial work as academic labor research project? And what questions did you set out to explore in your research? So Meredith, I think you should take this one because in, in many ways this idea started with you. Sure, yeah. So um, at my, so I'm also relatively new to Florida State. I've been here for about a year now, a little over a year. And, um, and so when I was on the job market a couple years ago, um, I started to notice that there were some really radical differences in the way what seemed like the exact same job would be classified at different universities and then the compensation and um, perks <laughs> that were associated with those different classifications. And so we started talking um, in this sort of working group that we had about, because a few of us were considering job moves. And so we started talking about how basically the same job with the same job responsibilities could have such radically different positionality within the university. And so that really led us to this research that we started. Um, and so uh, Claire and I actually distributed a survey last year to academic curators, uh, trying to get to some, uh, some data that would indicate what the experience was like for, um, for all of us across our different universities. Um, and so Claire and I actually, this research that we did, we presented at the AAMG conference this summer, and we're actually gonna represent that now um, for people who weren't able to attend that conference this summer. Um, and so I'll just get started, Claire. Yep. So, oh, well, before we do that, just to let folks know, we're going to present, just so, you, so there's a little bit of signposting here. We're going to present um, what we did at AMG, then we'll talk a little bit and open it up for discussion. So this isn't just a presentation. So make sure that you're typing your questions along the side or saving them until afterwards, and we'll we'll get to those after we wrap up this part of it. I just wanted to signal that for folks. So, yeah, yep, thank go you. Ahead. Excellent. Thank you, Claire. Um, so curators and academic museums and galleries work under a wide array of classifications, responsibilities, and expectations. The same position with the same job title and description could be tenure track faculty at one institution and staff at another. Through our own personal experience and work we have undertaken for other national professional organizations, we became familiar with these wide discrepancies in job classification and began to wonder what implications these differences could have for the professional development of academic curators. Next slide. And Claire is controlling the slides for both of us. So, um, and I will try to not be too weird in my signaling to her. <laughs> it's time to change them. Um, curators, uh, so this spring we released a survey and conducted a review of relevant existing research, trying to answer the following questions. What are the different classifications, job titles, and reporting structures in place in academic museums and galleries? How are curators in these positions evaluated and promoted? Are universities valuing and protecting curatorial work the same way they would any other research? How do these variables relate to larger issues like job satisfaction, retention, and work-life balance? And what should we as academic curators ask for from our institutions? Next slide. Our anonymous online survey consisted of 15 questions. Targeting academic museum and gallery professionals who self-identify as doing curatorial labor, the survey asked respondents about the nature of their institution, the classification of their position, the kind of work they perform, the system by which they are evaluated, their access to promotion, and their academic or scholarly freedom. The survey responses provide insights into the wide variations in experiences, job duties, and protections that academic curators encounter. Specifically, from the data collected in the survey, we determined that there are strong correlations between job classification and access to promotion and school type and academic freedom. Next slide. 84 respondents completed the survey, 36 from public research universities, 18 from regional public universities, 15 from private secular liberal arts colleges, seven from private religiously affiliated colleges, five from private research universities, and three from community colleges. 68% of respondents are classified as staff, while 17% are non-tenure earning faculty, 11% are administration, 
and 5% are tenure eligible faculty. Respondents reported dozens of different job titles, the most frequent being variations on director or curator. Titles such as registrar, collections manager, and exhibits manager were also reported, as well as ranked faculty positions such as assistant professor of museum studies. Respondents also reported a range of academic affiliations. The most common appointments were within departments of art or art history, but curators also identified working within departments of anthropology, sociology, design, merchandising, environmental design, my favorite, Arctic studies, as well as affiliations with administrative units such as the Office of the Provost or Academic Fairs or the Library or Archives. 26% of respondents have teaching responsibilities outlined in their appointment, while 66% do not. 7% reported that their teaching responsibilities were unclear. Next slide. A main goal of our survey was to better understand the paths academic curators have to promotion. Only 24% of respondents had paths to promotion outlined clearly and 39% identified as not eligible for promotion. While these numbers were surprising, another might be more significant. 37% reported that it was unclear whether they were eligible for promotion. The majority of curators, 81%, have their job performance reviewed by an individual, compared to 19% who are evaluated by a committee, the standard evaluation system for university faculty. Next slide. Academic freedom was analyzed through two questions. One, asking how frequently, if ever, respondents were pushed to change an exhibition based on its content. And the second, asking how frequently, if ever, respondents were pressured to utilize the resources of their museum or gallery to further goals other than those of the museum or gallery. The first question is a clear violation of academic freedom. And 77% reported that they have never been pressured in this way. The second question, however, speaks to the independence of the museum or gallery, and only 31% reported that they have never been asked to use their resources to further another unit's goals. Next slide. To better understand the protections afforded to curators, we asked whether the respondent institution considered their curatorial work to be research. Only 19% indicated that their college or university defined their work as research while 36% reported that it did not, and 45% said it was unclear. Of the 16 respondents whose universities consider their curatorial work to be research, only six, or 7% of total respondents, reported that their institution protects their curatorial work under the same guidelines they protect the research output of other scholars. Next slide. In further analyzing the data, there are several correlations that have repercussions for job satisfaction and retention. The most significant may be the relationship between job classification and access to promotion. Curators who are classified as staff are far less likely to be eligible for promotion, uh, promotion and to have their promotion path outlined in a written document. Only 10% of staff curators reported being eligible per, per promotion, with another 49% reporting that their eligibility for promotion was unclear. In contrast, 100% of tenure eligible faculty, 56% of administrators, and 43% of non-tenure earning faculty are in promotable positions. Although tenure track faculty have distinctive job titles, curators with the same title were classified across administration, staff, and non-tenure faculty, dependent on their institution. Those who happen to be classified as administration or faculty were four to five times more likely to have access to promotion than their counterparts who happened to be staff. Other strong areas of correlation concern scholarly independence. Although institution type does not impact factors such as job classification or access to promotion, it does impact scholarly freedom. Curators at private institutions were less likely to be asked to utilize their resources to further another unit's goal. 42% of respondents from private schools reported that they were never pressured to use their resources in this way, while 25% of public school curators reported that same level of independence. 
Similarly, at institutions where curatorial work is considered academic research, curators were twice as likely to report resource independence, with 50% of respondents stating that they never were pressured to redirect their resources. At institutions where curatorial work is not considered research, only 20% of respondents never felt this kind of pressure. So now I will pass it over to Claire. All right. So what I'm going to do, everyone can hear me okay, right? Yes? I can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is situate this a little bit in the bigger picture and think about how this connects to studies that are already out there, and then we'll circle back to next steps and ways that we can utilize the information that we found. So first of all, the AAMG Professional Practices for Academic Museums and Galleries, which was published in 2017, acknowledges the varied classifications of museum professional staff, from faculty status with tenure to staff and administrative appointments. AAMG recommends that, quote, in recognition of the core teaching, formal or informal, and research responsibilities of these positions, parent institutions seriously consider classifying them as tenurable faculty lines in the same way many university libraries have faculty positions that do not have formal teaching obligations, end quote. In addition, AAMG recommends that the institution should clearly define the criteria for evaluation for promotion and tenure, and such as peer-reviewed exhibitions, catalogs, and other museum-focused publications that demonstrate scholarly productivity and valuable research, writing, and creative work that is often disseminated outside of the traditional academic publications. The varied classifications of museum professionals are echoed in Corrine Cuisine's The Campus Art Museum, A Qualitative Study, Part 4, Challenges and Conditions of Success for Campus Art Museums, which was funded by the Samuel H. Kress Foundation in 2012. The study also said that a common complaint of curators and academic coordinators is that they have limited time and few resources for scholarly endeavors, as they curate shows, prepare for classes, or have guests lectures or museum tours, they research particular works of art or artists, but many want to have time and funding to go to other museums, libraries, or locations to do more in-depth research. Finally, we have the information provided by the 2017 AAMG Survey on Academic Reporting Structures, which you'll see on the screen here. Of the 265 responses, the vast majority, about 39.25%, or 104 of the responses, re report to a provost or vice president, followed by 24.91%, or 66 responses that report to an academic dean within a particular college, with the remainder reporting to, quote, other, 19.25%, or 51 responses. Some of them, 29 of which report, report to academic departments, 11 report to a president, and four report to a museum board. These responses will be added to as AAMG gears up to roll out a national survey in the next few years. There are no studies that look directly at academic museums or curatorial labor, um, and this is a section where I'm trying to think a little bit about what can we glean from literature on job satisfaction and higher education more generally. So while there's no studies that directly deal with academic museums or curatorial labor, there's a wealth of information available on job satisfaction in higher education, especially among faculty, from which we might be able to glean some parallels and useful information. Susan Horton's work from 2006 on differences in employee satisfaction between university faculty and staff provide key insights, including that satisfaction is not just determined by actual working conditions, but also aspirations, in other words, where you see yourself. In addition, there's a negative correlation between the level of education and job satisfaction, perhaps also linked to aspiration, and that there are some parallels in areas of greatest dissatisfaction across faculty and staff, specifically from a framework of what R.H. Mormon calls, quote, organizational justice or, quote, the ways in which employees determine if they have been treated fairly in their jobs and the ways in which these determinations influence other work or related variables, end quote. Organizational justice in an academic framework includes a work-life balance, work demand and workload, departmental fit, professional development resources, and a sense of alignment between one's work within the university direction, in other words, the, the mission of the university. 
From faculty to the assembly line and beyond, studies suggest that workers want some degree of autonomy in their work, recognition from their peers and supervisors, time for leisure and family, and fair pay. The university or college's commitment to their fields is correlated to faculty satisfaction with the tenure and promotion process, and that faculty members who were more satisfied with their work-life balance also saw reasonableness in the expectations of their positions. In addition, collegial department cli climate and mentoring provided many benefits to faculty, including a better understanding of the expectations of tenure and promotion, teaching and service and research, a better work-life integration, and an obligation to mentor others. In other words, an obligation to pass it along. However, mentoring is con consistently seen as an unmet need. Institutional emulation of best practices of support, supportive climates of work-life balance and belief that one's work is valued by the university can provide scaffolding for faculty success, as well as possibly also their retention and commitment to their institution. The next thing I looked at was, were there any relationships between access to job promotion and job satisfaction? At the faculty level, facu factors that influence job satisfaction, especially pre-tenure, are institutional support, equitable treatment, mentoring, and an individual sense of control and agency during the tenure dossier construction process. Studies suggest that faculty who have not yet earned tenure and believe campus decisions are inequitable often depart the institution prior to review, especially women and other underrepresented populations. Among tenured faculty, negative experiences during the tenure process can result in diminished institutional citizenship behavior, in other words, connections between the individual and the institution, as well as diminished productivity and lower job satisfaction. Studies from outside the academy also suggest that, the prom that promotions and possibility of promotion lead to increased job satisfaction. For example, looking at data from a na national longitudinal study by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Persons who have received promotion in the past two years during the study had increased job satisfaction, even while controlling for the worker's current wage, wage within rank for his, his or her peer group and wage growth. Workers who believe that promotion is possible in the next two years also report higher job satisfaction. And additionally, past promotions have a lingering but fading impact on job satisfaction. St the study states that the effect of promotion is roughly equal to a 69% increase in workers' hourly wage. The high level of job satisfaction is also maintained by workers who do not receive a promotion but believe it is possible, suggesting that promotions can be an important means by which to increase job satisfaction and contribute to a reduction in turnover. So now we are going to shift to the so what. So thinking about what we should advocate for in contract negotiations um, and thinking about shifts in classification and reporting structure within our parent institution. So for this, Meredith and I are gonna um, take turns. So I'll start with you, Meredith. Sure, um, our number one recommendation is for museums to advocate for reclassification of positions as tenurable faculty. And as Claire mentioned, this is also an AAMG recommendation um, that would see museums follow <clears throat> a pattern that's been established by institutional libraries to make librarians tenurable in the same way museum curators uh, would be afforded a clear path to promotion and better support for research as tenurable faculty. Right. So the next, uh, the next thing to advocate for is to make staff lines promotable. So in situations where conversion to tenure faculty status is untenable or can only happen as part of a long-term plan, then formally outlining paths to promotion for staff administration and non-tenure eligible faculty lines will impact positively job satisfaction and retention. Also, institutions should dedicate resources for scholarly endeavors. Um, and I would also include professional development funding under this category. Um, and oftentimes, I know at least in my institution, it can be very hard to advocate for raises or for reclassifications, but oftentimes you can get an increased budget for research support and professional development support. 
So another thing to advocate for is formal mentoring opportunities, both inside and outside of your institution. So thinking about the ways that you, your institution can create mentor, mentoring opportunities, both within the university and then looking outside of the institution for curators, things like the AAMC's uh, mentoring program and other places like that are, are important. So mentoring is important and often underutilized. Also, your museum should emulate best institutional practices. I think this is particularly concerning issues of work-life balance and, um, and promoting a sense of work-life balance. In addition, promoting a culture that sees and recognizes work and labor um, and that um, actively um, celebrates good work. Address equity and pay, of course, um, 100 percent. This is this is very essential and as something we should have mentioned, uh, one thing that we will be distributing in some manner, either I can point us to a URL or um, there might be another way to um, to distribute it. We have a handout that has resources um, for frameworks on negotiation strategies, amongst other things. And so I want to make sure that everyone has access to that um, so they have resources available in their back pocket to start to address these inequities. Sure. Did you want to try and share that now? Or once we have the, the recording up on our website, I can share all sorts of resources then as well. I will try to um, see if I can share it after we get done with the PowerPoint to see if I can share other documents as we're doing the q and I'll do that. So okay, um, if that doesn't happen, then I will then we can we can also share it as you distribute it at the uh, at the end with the recording. Yeah, and I'm hoping um, all the resources that you're mentioning that we'll have links to all of those um, and hopefully the PowerPoint as well, because you can't always see the entire PowerPoint with Skype going as well. Yep, so I'd love yep. to share all of that. Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, and our last point is that museums should advocate for the reclassification of curatorial work to be considered research. Um, and this is another thing that's really important and potentially easy to advocate for within your university. Um, and if you can achieve this to have curatorial work considered research, it will create greater autonomy for curators and museums. And it will also help in advocating for institutional resources to support re research related expenses. Right. So then um, just so that you can see the last couple of slides that we're going to share with everyone so you don't have to rush and write this down. I'm just going to run through them quickly. Um, so this is what I mentioned, um, a couple of negotiation resources, uh, the AMD salary survey, um, the um, the POW art salary survey that was coming out this uh, that, that just was revised the um, museum gender and equity five things you need to know and then the um, the Google document that I've included a, a link to the hyperallergic article about museum workers and then also this book ask for it how women can use the power of negotiation to get what they really want so those are some resources available for negotiation. Um, and then we have a couple of slides here that are our sources for the content and the, the studies that we referenced in our presentation. So here with links as they are available, but you can, you can dig back into this material as you see fit. So that's our presentation portion. So I'm going to see if I can share that document as we do this, but um, we can transition to the next questions. Yes, of course. I just want to warn everyone, I'm on one bar of, of internet connection. So if I magically disappear, I'm sorry. My internet is just being a little funky right now. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> You're doing good uh, so far. This is, this is really great. Your resources are incredible. And it feels very empowering listening to all of this. So thank you. Um, my question is, what are your next steps for this project? Um, Meredith, yeah. do you want to take that? Sure. Yeah. So Claire and I would like to do um, another layer to the survey. Um, we did not in our initial round of surveying, we did not ask about um, the demographics of the respondees. So gender, race, ethnicity, things like that. We also did not ask whether um, whether respondees were part of a union. Um, I know, for example, I'm part of the faculty union for Florida State University and the University of Florida. 
And so there are a lot of protections that I receive because of my union affiliation. And so um, that would be another line of questioning that could add um, some value and information to this topic. Um, and then also we suspect that a lot of these factors that we've discussed could be correlated to things like gender and race and ethnicity. And so it would be useful and instructive to get that information as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. And I also, I'm just jumping in there. I, I haven't used Skype for Business that much before, but I do think I just uploaded the PDF. So I think that everyone listening can download both the PowerPoint that we just shared as well as the PDF here. And if that does not work for whatever reason, we will also share it when the recording goes out. Okay, yeah, I had a, a bar show up at the bottom of my screen and I was able to open it. Um, so if anyone has any problems, they can also um, ask me to try and troubleshoot if they can't open it. And thank you, Anne. <laughs> yeah, I was actually going to follow up with a question about yeah. unions, um, at least partially because I'm not incredibly familiar with the entire museum world. Um, but what kinds of unions are generally available to people? Is it, I assume it's through the university, um, but also if you don't have access to a union, are, are there other groups or are you considering sort of creating an advocacy group as a way to, to help others? I mean, how, how can you advocate um, as, as a group of people? Yeah, Claire, are you, are you unionized at SUNY? Yeah, so we are unionized and we are through the United University Professions. So I think that um, at the at academic museums, it really depends on whether or not there's union, a union or unions available at your um, at your institution. Um, in terms of advocacy on a, a larger scale, it's not something that Meredith and I have addressed just yet, but I think that what is really important is arming yourself with information. Um, so I think that some of those negotiation resources, especially on salary surveys and that Google Doc for folks in the museum who are the salaries of, of what folks are making within the museum world are, are helpful as a, as a starting place. Um, but obviously that's not the same as having the, the power of a, a union behind you. Yeah, and, and to add to that, I would also say that um, most of us who are academic curators, unless we're at a very large institution, there might be two or three of us in our museum that have the same classification that we do. I know I am the only person classified as a curator at Florida State University, which is a mm -hmm. massive institution. Um, and so because of that, it, it can feel kind of alienating and um, it can be hard to advocate because we are in some ways um, considered part of a peer group of faculty and staff within our institutions, but also separate from them. And so um, it's not like in a library where there's going to be many librarians who can all advocate together. And right, so right. I think that it is really important to distribute this information so that we can as a body be going to our institutions and asking for things and saying, hey, here's, here's the data on this, here's what my peer institutions are doing. Um, just because there isn't usually a large enough sample size within our individual universities to be um, to be really pushing the needle too hard. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that once we have this recording, we can actually put all these resources together and share them even more widely. Um, so I, I'm really happy to be having this discussion, and I really feel like this is something that needs to move forward, especially considering the other you know, say the spreadsheets that have been going out with anonymous salaries and things like that. Um, I think this discussion needs to go forward and we need to get more people involved for sure. Yeah. And, and something just to sort of jump in, um, jump in on that. And I see that there's a there's a, a message coming in, but just to, to jump off of Meredith, something that Meredith and I would like to get out of this conversation is, and, and she may have said this as I was trying to find the file, um, is we'd like to hear what, what other material folks need. Um, are we missing things? Um, and if there's other things that folks think are useful next steps as we continue to move on this project, because it's not, it's not just 
for the two of us. It is for all of us. We want to hear. Um, we want to hear that. We'd like to hear what people have asked for and gotten. And if there's successful negotiations that other people have um, have had, if folks are willing to share those, if not in this conversation, in in later iterations of things. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, we have someone who said um, they're also in a non-union state and have no peers in their university in terms of being an academic curator. Um, but she does have colleagues who are directors, meaning other people in the university who are in between tenure track faculty and staff. And we're looking, she's looking for ways um, to have the jobs be standardized in terms of promotion, salary, and benefits. Yeah, so, and, well, and also that can be really tricky too, depending on whether you're at a public or private institution. Mm -hmm. um, I know, um, I have a good friend who's at a private, who's at a public institution, but the class job classifications for his university are standardized across the entire state. And so um, it took him, it took an awful lot for him to advocate to be reclassified into a different classification system because it was this statewide system that was not particularly responsive to the individual nuances of his particular position. And so I think, again, there can be a very wide difference between being at a private institution and a public institution, and then also how large the system is that you're working within can, can make it more complicated as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a question from Mara Baldwin. Um, she's asking, how would promotion work if one was the only staff, um, her position is director and her staff includes one preparator who only works during installation periods or in a part-time or temporary role? Uh, she says, for example, there's no path to become an executive director if there's no one to delegate to, correct? So this was a, a position that I was in at Augustana. Um, and so one, I mean, so the, I mean, obviously I didn't follow this because I'm no longer at Augustana. And honestly, that was a, a struggle for me at Augustana was that I didn't know what promotion looked like there. But the answer doesn't have to be that you jump like I do. I did. Um, but I think that maybe thinking about uh, what Elizabeth was just talking about in terms of standardization of, of promotion, salary, and benefits, maybe it's not promotion to executive director, but promotion within the job title, like if there is, if there's any standardization across the institution, and I don't know, um, but that was something that, you know, if, if your position is classified as some level within the university or college, if there, if there is a standardized set of staff positions, is it possible to move up the ranks because your job, if you can, if you can uh, make the argument that your job expectations have grown, even though there's not necessarily a path to promotion to executive director, is there a possibility of a promotion in pay and a different type of title while maintaining the the question, the the actual title of director? And I don't know if that's possible, but that's something that I was starting to look into at Augie because they were starting to standardize the positions across the, the college. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think and I, sorry, go ahead. I'm, I was just going to say, unfortunately, you know, I was in a similar position to Claire when I was at Indiana State University. And ultimately, I left because there was no path to promotion. Um, and so and what what was kind of interesting about my position there was I, I went to my department chair, I went to my dean, and they both said, you're doing excellent work. We'd love to get you a raise. We'd love to find something that we can do for you. Can you go out and get an offer from another institution and bring it back, and then we can use that as leverage? And oh, wow. <laughs> I did that, and the offer was a little bit too good. Um, and so they said, you should just go to Florida State. We can't compete with this. Um, so I do, I do think that um, that it's it can be really hard to get leverage, mm -hmm. and ultimately the really the only card that you have to play sometimes is is leaving, and um, or at least being willing to leave. And so I don't know. I mean, obviously uh, for a lot of us, leaving is not a possibility because of any other things that are going on in our lives. But um, going out sometimes I know. Seeing, seeing what else is out there, right, could be useful for you in approaching your own institution. Although, and also, oh, go ahead. 
Yeah. And I was going to say, and also using the information that we that 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 we can start to amass together of comparing of comparables across other institutions um, and, and thinking about both inside and outside of your institution. Is there information that you can gather to, you know, short of having, you know, formalized promotion frameworks that are either established at your institution or through your union, if you don't have those things, are there are there other modes of information that can help you in your negotiation strategy? Mm -hmm. And actually, AMG is coming out with <clears throat> a newer survey of um, or trying to create a sort of comprehensive listing of all of the academic museums in the US, mm -hmm. uh, which will be separatable by whether it's an art museum or not. Um, and I think that'll be really helpful in sort of moving forward with a more, with, with places to look and be able to compare. And I'm not sure what all of the points of analysis are going to be that they have, but I think it'll be a great place to expand from. And that's something that we're waiting for with a lot of excitement as well. Uh, we also have a comment from Elizabeth. Um, she said, Claire, that's a good point. We directors are looking into something like director level one or something like that. I'm at a small private university, so banding together with these other directors is useful, although I'm lumped together with biology lab manager and language instruct instructors, etc. But we all want similar things in terms of standardized opportunities. So it's, yeah, it sounds like it's not, um, not just across the board with, with different museums, but different folks at different levels um, across the board. And I will point out that the AAMD salary survey, so the um, Association of Art Museum Directors salary survey, does have an appendix at the end that is university museums and galleries. I think there's something like 56 institutions that have reported. I have some questions about what types of institutions those are because you can't really dig into that data. Um, but um, because I've tried to use those numbers in a number of different situations before and like it doesn't hold water because the numbers are so far beyond um, where where even upper level staff are getting paid. Um, so I, I, I am hoping that as we as we dig into this a little bit more, perhaps we can get more information even from AMD on what are what are the types of institutions? What are the size of those institutions? Maybe that's something that is that can be cross compared with AMG's Co cohesive survey of academic museums and galleries to try to get a better sense of the data. Yeah, and we would love, uh, everyone at RAMP, I think, would love to be um, involved in that project and to help advocate in any way that, that you see fit. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're very happy about that. Yeah. Um, and Elizabeth has another question for you, Claire. Uh, she said she was going to ask about the university museum salaries in the AAMD survey. I was a little surprised to see how high the salaries are, although pleasantly surprised. Yeah, so we must just be on just the same the wavelength that I was about to go there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and actually AAM, AAMD is a, um, as in the is um, the requirements for becoming a member are pretty um, tight. And so it is not, so that organization, their data is, going to be bent in a certain direction just based on the membership. Well, and my question there, which is still opaque to me, is whether or not everyone that, are they only surveying their own members in that salary survey? Because there's, because it, I don't believe that there's 56 university museums that are actually members of AMD. I don't know that for sure. I would be surprised if there were. Yeah, so that's why I'm saying that I, I or questions about what's what's driving that like who who are they who are they surveying because I, I if there are 56 or 50 some odd data points of academic museums that responded to that survey what percentage who can I find out a little bit more information about the demographics of those museums yeah mm -hmm. and we also have Mara saying that she agrees that the title of director on a college campus can be used very liberally um, she's technically in the same grouping as the director of spiritual life and the director of athletics with five dollar signs. Uh, <laughs> I think we all know what that means. Um, yeah. <laughs> although the campus, the leverage on campus can vary widely. Yeah, I wish I was on the same level as the director of athletics at FSU. That would 
that'd be pretty awesome. <laughs> but and actually, I was going to say that um, recently, so um, some public universities have undergone efforts to make staff positions promotable and to make non-tenure earning faculty positions promotable. I know that um, in Florida, FSU and U of F are going, have gone through this process in the past 10 or 15 years, um, just because it does have really significant implications for job satisfaction. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's my cat. Um, <laughs> I'm glad to have her as a part of RAMP. <laughs> um, and so, uh, and so I think it is something that, that the universities want to do ultimately because it does, it can have serious impacts on job retention. So. Mm -hmm. And just jumping into the second part of Mara's um, statement there, that there are just two directors without any staff support, the gallery and the LGBT center um, on her campus. Again, that 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 sounds familiar to me um, in relation to past um, past institutions that I've worked at in terms of where where is the staff support and where is there very little staff support? And I'm just going to leave it there by saying it's disappointing. Mm -hmm. so. Well, while we're waiting for other questions to come in, if there are any other questions, what have you learned about yourselves during this project? Claire, do you want to go first? Um, I mean, so the, this, what have I learned about myself from this project? I mean, it it is part of a larger set of research projects that I've been working on where my research has been aligning more um, intentionally with my um, my my politics um so that's been that's been you know it, it's been reinforcing those those questions and those perspectives in my life and honestly it's been it's been helpful in me framing my own job searches um and thinking about what types of institutions that i wanted to work for and work at as i was going through my most recent job search that ended with me um joining binghamton university the fact that Binghamton had a union, that there was possibility for um, promotion that's built into that union structure was really important um, for me as I, as, I, as I weighed my different options. And so that's a couple of things that I've learned about myself. What about you, Meredith? I think, um, you know, like a lot of women, I, when I have been on the job market previously, I did not know what to ask for in the negotiation phase and so didn't really end up asking for anything um and i was actually lucky when i accepted the position here at fsu um a mentor of mine at another institution gave me some advice and said hey here are four things that you should ask for and um and it was really excellent advice i got all four of them and so um what this has reinforced for me though is that we we aren't going to get things unless we advocate for ourselves there isn't like a like a magic fairy who's going to come down and like help us all get better jobs and so it means that we need to be more uh informed right and then also get over some of our hang-ups about asking for things and so um for me it's really reinforced that that i'm gonna have to continue my own development and negotiation and advocacy advocacy skills um on my own behalf as well and jumping off of that, I think that that these conversations of not just asking for it to, you know, so I pulled up the negotiation resources because I thought that might be a better thing for us to, to have on the on the screen, but also that we're communicating with each other and, and having these conversations and sharing with each other, you know, the realities of our jobs so that we're not all operating in the dark in our own, you know, isolated spaces. I think that that's really important as well. Because that helps me advocate for myself and it helps me lift all of our boats up. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I was going to ask, where do you find these mentorship opportunities and these collaborative opportunities? Were there some places or some um, events that really helped with that? Um, yeah, so I have, um, I was really lucky when I was an undergraduate, I had a professor who was um, very supportive and has remained very supportive for me um, throughout my career. Um, and then when I was at Indiana State, I also, I had a department chair there who really um, was very helpful for me as well. 
And now that I'm here at FSU, we actually have a more formalized mentorship program for faculty. So I do have a designated mentor um, who's a full professor who is sort of helping me through promotion processes, tenure, stuff like that. Um, it is it is really wonderful. And I actually think that oftentimes those official mentorship programs are built into tenure track faculty positions more, um, more frequently than they are built into staff positions. And so that's another thing that I think that we could be better advocates for is um, finding ways, even if we can't be formal mentors for people who are uh, you know, coming up behind us to be informal mentors. And so I know I'm trying to return that favor now with um, students that I've taught and mm -hmm. um, younger staff members who are coming through the museum. Um, and then I, I personally, I go to, I do a lot of work with CAA. Actually, I'm on the Professional Practices Committee. Um, and that's been a really wonderful opportunity for me. I've gotten to know um, several academic curators through that process. Um, and we're actually right now drafting language that will become um, standards and guidelines for tenure track curatorial positions mm -hmm. that CAA will um, hopefully publish in the next two years. And so if anyone who is on this conference is interested in being a reader for that, would like to be involved in that project, um, and you wanna just kind of send along a message or something, that would be great. We're um, sending it out to readers soon. Um, great, and I can also post that on RAMP for you as well and, and in our newsletter. So if you could send me that language, I can yeah. get that out there as well. That would be great. Um, and so I think what we're doing, what I personally try and do is get involved in professional organizations, go to conferences, um, and uh, just sort of push myself to always be a little bit more out there than would naturally be my inclination. Um, and so, but I, I personally, I have gotten a lot of, a lot of rewarding um, relationships and community from work with CAA. So. Wonderful. Yeah, I think, especially, um, say when I was a student, you know, people are always talking about networking and it sounds a little bit too corporate. But really, I mean, net networking is part of, yeah, advocacy and self-advocacy. Right. It's really, yeah, you know, you have to know other people in the field in order to to sort of see where you fit there and what you can do with that. Yeah, jumping jumping off of that um, to to other other spaces that I um, or one other space in particular that I. Well, I guess one thing first is that sometimes I, I think about my role as an academic curator that I, I have questions about who are my people, if, because as I think about conferences that I should I am involved in or should be involved in, it feels like I need to be involved in a multiplicity of conferences that one doesn't serve all of my needs. So I regularly attend CAA, CCAC, AAMG, and then AAMC, um, which I got a travel fellowship for a couple of years ago, which was really helpful because that allows me entry into, um, you know, these invite only sort of networking sessions, which has been which has been quite helpful. AAMC also has a mentoring, a formal mentoring program. But another program that I want to make a plug for is the Getty Leadership Institute has the next gen program. And I also know that there's a curatorial leadership program that's out there as well. But I took part in the GLI next gen in 2018. And that was really helpful for me to think big picture about the relationship of academic museums to the larger museum field, but then also thinking about my development as a leader and it has built in networks and uh, mentoring opportunities that have been really helpful for me. So those are just, you know, just to jump in on things, but I, um, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. Yeah, we're trying to do quite a bit with, with mentoring and professional development at CAA as well. Um, so hopefully we'll have more resources for that. Um, and we also have another comment from Mara. Um, she says it would seem it seems like it would be a good idea to be very mindful before adding demographic classification to your next survey. Um, a lot of feedback and kickback was offered up this summer to the living document with salary information when demographics were added to the field. Mm -hmm. um, I think just thinking about why that information is important and thinking about how it will be used should be considered and then all written up instead of it just being an open response field, which may be critical for building trust and transparency in the process. Which, yeah, thank you for that, Mara. Yeah, yeah, I think that's you. really astute. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And we, so the way we got survey respondents for the first round was through the AAMG listserv. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and I think that maybe in the next round we would be uh, try and cast a slightly bigger net 
to individuals who are not affiliated with that organization. And so it is a good point to be really mindful about how we're asking for information and then how that information will be used. Mm -hmm. Do you know of any guidelines for that in case other folks were also interested in getting these kind of analyzable pieces of data? Yeah, well, so if you are at a university, college or university, then you need to go through your university's um, human research board mm -hmm. um, yeah. to get approved. And so we went through this, we started this process when Claire was still at Augustana. And Augustana told us that it would be faster to go through FSU, which I don't <laughs> think could be true. Um, <laughs> do all of this um, FSU as a huge research university with like a medical school and all this stuff makes you go through um, this pretty intense research training. So now Claire and I know how to like oh, handle fetal tissue and stuff like that. But um, <laughs> what was good about it is that it um, did provide a little bit of knowledge and information about how to word questions, what kind of information you can ask for, and then how to ethically handle that information. And so it, it was a really good process. And so I think all of us are affiliated with colleges or universities. And so I think that your um, your review board, your human rights or human subjects board might be the best place for you to mm -hmm. start with thinking about if you're going to want to put out any kind of survey or um, anything that would require a response from a human subject that would then become research, you would have to get approved. Right. So. Oh, I guess my big questions about demographics are more institution, not even, I mean, maybe demographics isn't even the right word, but I'd like to know a little bit more information about the types of institutions that are, are reporting information, mm -hmm. like thinking about the AAMD survey. So not who the individuals are and the demographics of them, but rather, you know, are these, like, what is the staff size of that, of that institution? What is the, you know, yeah, is it getting into questions that, that Meredith and I um, asked? Anyways, but that's just, so maybe demographics is not the right word for that, but. Okay. Well, it seems like everyone has a lot to think about. Um, oh, we have another question. Um, and this is Mara, and she says, one field I think would be really interesting in delving into is how job postings are evolving with the doctorate required or strongly preferred for both teaching and non-teaching positions. I came into directorial work on the coattails of getting my MFA, and I just found that I was good at the work but enjoying and enjoy working curatorially. But now I look at the field for other positions to potentially apply to, and I'm finding myself underqualified not having a PhD. Understanding why this is changing and whether it's benefiting the exhibitions or institutions or museum visitors, and how it is also a hindrance to getting new voices in the field potentially. Yeah, this is a really interesting topic because generally, um, if you look at the demographics of MFA programs versus PhD programs, MFA programs tend to be more diverse um, and are feeding, are putting through a different demographic. Of people. And so it is interesting considering there certainly is a PhD pipeline problem. And um, I, I teach in a master's, I teach in the MFA program here and then also in a museum studies MA program. And so most of my colleagues are PhDs. I personally have an MFA. Um, and actually this February at CAA, I'll be chairing a panel on the artist as curator, talking about yes. some of the issues about sort of the professionalization of the curatorial field and how, um, and how that's actually a really modern idea that, um, you know, really a hundred years ago, artists were curators and curators were artists. There was no professional curator. And in some ways, I think that actually the proliferation of museum studies programs is sort of fueling this trend in a lot of ways. And, um, but it is, I think there are certainly always gonna be institutions where the PhD will be the preferred degree for a gallery director or curator or museum curator. Um, and then I think there are other institutions where an MFA would actually be preferred. I know for my position, um, there's two faculty members in my unit. One is a PhD art historian, I'm an MFA. They kind of wanted that balance of both. And so um, I don't know, it's, it's an interesting, I, I'm not sure that someone with a PhD is necessarily more qualified to do the work that I do. In fact, I'm pretty confident they're probably not. And so, 
it's, it is an interesting conundrum, though, for those of us who are practicing artists. Yeah, I find this very interesting because I um, I just received my PhD and there was a lot of different conversations going on about um, you know working in the in the curatorial field and sort of folks' anxieties about that, um, but also experientially, a lot of PhDs are forced into a lot of assistantships that maybe have nothing to do with that, and they're really not getting the kind of support to even understand what types of jobs are out there. Um, so a lot of times they're also at a, a bizarre disadvantage and the expectations of PhD MFA or, or MA are wildly different from different institutions. So they're, they're, they don't seem to know what to expect of you either. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Claire, you're, you're a PhD holder. What do you think? No, I mean, I think that it, it, it is a problematic pipeline and I do think that the idea that you have to have a PhD to to do the work that we're doing at the exclusion of MFAs becomes problematic. I think that a better framework would be, you know, some what is what is that called the terminal degree? So like sort of opening it up so that it's PhD or MFA because I think there's there's benefits to whichever track and having a multiplicity of voices at the table instead of just reproducing. Um, the knowledge of a PhD becomes a, a problematic framework. You know, I mean, I'm glad. You know, I'm I'm thankful for my PhD, but I I don't think that that's the only way to engage in the in the world as a as a curator. Um, and I think that there's a lot of things that I don't. Yeah, as you pointed out, that that an MFA experience allows you to engage with that a PhD doesn't. Uh, when I first started my job at Augustana, I had to. Uh, I, I took the job and had a preparator, and when I started the job, I didn't have a preparator anymore, and suddenly I had to hang a show, which is something that as a PhD, I had absolutely no training um, in and had to learn very quickly. Not that there's a, a, like a formal element of that in an MFA program, but you're, you're closer to engaging with your own artwork um, in an MFA program. And so I think that it at the end of the day is is foolish to narrow in in that in that framework so that's my input. Yeah, I tend to think that too and I, I really like collaborating with folks that do have a different background and different experience I think that just makes any kind of collaboration richer yeah and um, Mara also said maybe also searching for a correlation for whether PhDs are required and how the salaries are funded so do these jobs pay more it's unclear but I think this is actually probably untrue since job postings infrequently include their salaries, that might be hard to know or measure, which is also, yeah, a question that came up in my head as well. Well, and also there's, there was recently a Google Doc uh, going around of academic um, ac faculty um, that, salaries. I don't know if anyone was it else. Adjunct or the was it full? Uh, well, it started out. It started out as adjunct, but then it has been opened up to faculty of all rank. Right. And um, and so I spent some time looking at that just because I was curious. Um, and because some people at my own institution had filled it out, so I was like, oh, I'm curious what's going on. Um, but the, um, I was really, really surprised at the incredibly wide discrepancy mm -hmm. um, that exists even in tenure and tenure earning faculty. So there were some people who were like an associate professor making $45,000 a year, and there were some people who were an associate professor making $110,000 a year, both in the humanities. And so um, just that wide, wide variation in um, in salary is is pretty pretty was pretty remarkable to me. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the institution that you're at, um, the location of the institution. Um, but I don't know. It would be interesting to look through that spreadsheet and see because it did. There was a section. There was a field for the highest degree earned. And so it would be really interesting to go through and see if there's any correlation between highest degree earned and um, and salary. I know, actually, I know at my institution, at least within my college, there is not a correlation between PhD faculty and MFA faculty on salary. We did a study on that a couple years ago. And so, um, I, but I don't know what it would be like uh, across the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would be happy to share a link to that spreadsheet again, because I think 
um, it's wildly fascinating and um, and has grown since I last looked at it. So um, yeah, I'd love to share a link to that and we can all analyze it and come up with more questions. Yeah, it can make you feel better or worse, depending on- Simultaneously. <laughs> yeah, so I looked at it and I was like, oh, it's not so bad. And then I was like, oh, but, oh, but I could. Um, and then one thing actually that I would just add, so Claire and I gave this presentation at the AMG conference and uh, opened up for questions after, and someone actually raised their hand from Yale, and I was kind of surprised. Um, and she said that at, uh, at the Yale gallery, they, you are not required to have a PhD to be, um, to be working in their curatorial program. And so she said, if we converted these positions to tenure track, then like half of the people at the Yale Art Gallery would not be able to be employed in those mm -hmm. positions. And then I think, um, you know, there, there would have to be some kind of understanding or recalibration of the uh, tenure structure within these kinds of positions to ensure that work is being properly categorized as research, service, and teaching. Um, and that's, again, something that um, the Professional Practices Committee uh, at CAA is, is working on. Yeah, I'm very excited to see what you come up with. Um, so we've been on for about, an, well, a little over an hour now. So unless there are any last minute questions, um, I may let you go and allow everyone to stew over this conversation um, and we'll get the recording together and we'll be in touch with you about trying to share all of these links and any other resources that have come up. Um, and it's been really lovely teaching, talking with you. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. teaching with you, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> all the above, thank you, everyone. It, yeah, and from you. the perspective of a current graduate student and unknown of what my future looks like, this feels, this is really encouraging, I know that it's uncertain what kind of salaries are out there. I feel like a lot of students in my program, everyone wants to be a curator. It's a really exciting field, but this has been really, it's encouraging. And thank you so much for all of the research you've done and putting this into words and presentations to encourage us to and feel empowered and to advocate for ourselves. So thank you. This is really great for, for a, 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 an emerging professional in the field. This is really great. Thank you. Yeah, and I am hoping um, just as a, a last minute mention i'm hoping to have both laura and olivia talk about their different programs in museum administration and museum studies and hopefully we can get some questions and answers from other mentors and also students that are looking into these programs so that's something that we're going to be announcing a little bit later as well great, great. and thank you laura thank you thank you meredith thank you claire yeah thank you okay have a good afternoon everyone yeah bye bye, bye.